Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, The State of Trade. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, The State of Trade, Revisiting 301 Tariffs, What's in Store for U.S.-China Trade Relations. Before we begin, a few procedural points. At the end of the session, time permitting, we'll hold a question and answer um, period. And you can ask your questions through a function called Slido. We'll drop a link in the chat, and you can ask you know, questions there. Um, those questions will only be visible to you and to the Flexwork team, so you don't have to be shy. Um, we will share a copy of the slide deck at the end of the presentation. Um, now, to make the lawyers happy, a brief legal note. Please do keep in mind that all information provided in this session is based on the situation at this current time and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. None of us are lawyers, and we always recommend reaching out to a Flexport, Flexport expert to discuss your particular situation. All right, now let's get down to it. I am Phil Levy. I am Chief Economist at Flexport. I am joined by Chris Rogers in London, our Principal Supply Chain Economist. Um, good morning or good afternoon, Chris. Hi there. And I am thrilled to welcome Chad Baum, the, the Reginald Jones Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Chad and I go way back. He has an extraordinary list of accomplishments. He was Senior Economist for Trade at the Council of Economic Advisors. He has worked at the World Bank. He has taught at Brandeis. He's been at the heart of efforts to gather critical trade policy data on topics such as anti-dumping. And he has led efforts to analyze the functioning of the WTO dispute settlement system, um, to name just a couple of his important areas of work. He's also been a clear and prolific commentator on trade policy development, serving as the host of the excellent podcast, Trade Talks. How many underscores does that have, Chad? Two, two, he says. Okay, news to me. All right, I listen all the time. Um, so, so trade talks, and you ought to as well. But we're delighted to have him here with us. So, Chad, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks, Phil. All right. So today we are going to discuss the Section 301 tariffs the U.S. imposed on China. They've been in place for four years, so we are statutorily required to review them. I'm not actually, I'm just kidding. We're not statutorily required to do anything. The Biden administration is, is statutorily required to do this, which we thought would make a very nice news peg to see what will they do, what should they do, um, and what will come next after that. So that's why we're turning to this now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a recap of how we ended up with tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars of imports from China to the U.S. Um, we're going to ask what effect those tariffs have had um, and look at that from a number of different angles. We're going to talk about what the Biden administration is likely to do in the near term, both with the review and potentially with negotiations that follow. And then we'll turn to what we see happening economically in the U.S.-China relation, trade relationship uh, in the longer run. Uh, as is our want, however, we will start by seeing what you all are thinking on the topic. So we're going to do a poll. Um, and here is our first poll question. You can see the, the polls on the tab over on the right. So the question to you all, has the Biden administration's stance toward China, and we're talking about uh, trade matters here, been tougher than you expected, just what you expected, less tough than you expected, or I don't know, I haven't really paid attention so far. Um, actually, some of you have actually confessed to that. Okay, um, so <laughs> let's see what you all say. Um, what, what, and this is really sort of setting the stage on the expectations. Then we're going to go and see where we're coming from. It looks like um, we're, oh, it's sort of neck and neck. Thank you for those who are answering. This is kind of exciting to watch in, in real time as these things bounce around. But um, it looks like you all weren't terribly surprised by what the Biden administration did. But those who were, it came off a little less tough. So, um, but actually an interesting spread here um, for this. So, well, cool. We'll see. We'll, we'll talk it through and see what has happened and where they seem to be going. Um, but I think the, so far the winner looks to be that it's been pretty much what you expected. All right, let's jump right in then and let's talk about, you know, what led up to the Biden administration. Where do we come from and what was going on with all of this? And thank you again, everyone, for, for voting on that. All right, let's let's jump into our slides. Um, how did we get here? Um, the so. The, let me say right up front, this slide pains me a little bit. Um, I find it, it, it difficult because it's showing trade deficit, merchandise trade deficit. And in fact, it's showing bilateral trade deficits. And I've spent years, and I'm hardly alone in this as a sort of standard boilerplate for economists, 
but it's in that economically, this is not what matters. There's a huge temptation to look at trade deficits and to take them as a scorecard for how well or how poorly a country is doing. Um, we could spend an entire session talking about why that's not a good thing to do. Uh, I and mean, Chad, maybe you have your favorite answer as to why, which you can toss in later. I, I would, the, the answer I like to give is that if you look at the things we care about, what, what do we really think of as economic well-being? It's, when is the economy booming? When is unemployment low? We usually see tr high trade deficits in those times. And when we go into a real slump, you often see the trade deficit moderate. And that's talking about the overall trade deficit, not even bilateral. So, Chad, first, maybe you have an even better explanation or a better explanation um, as to that. But I also wanted to get you to say something that, and hopefully justify us putting this up in terms of what role did – and here we're showing a longer view of trade deficits. This is going back to the George W. Bush administration. What role did this play in the sort of politics of China trade policy in terms of driving some of the actions that we saw in the Trump administration? Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably – so thank you for the, the opportunity to, to join you. Um, I think you've nailed it. This, this probably – if you had to put up one chart that would summarize um, certainly candidate Trump and President Trump's view of the, the problematic uh, trade relationship that the United States has with anybody, it would be the bilateral trade deficit. And so, you know – the, the story was in their administration, they had basically lined up the countries with which the United States had uh, bilateral trade deficits, meaning we exported less to them than we imported from them every year, and they'd identified them as the problem countries and, and went after them in one way or the other. So that included, you know, Mexico um, with renegotiating the NAFTA, the USMCA, but then certainly also was, was China. Um, and President or candidate Trump ran on that. And then when he, you know, was elected, this was this was his beacon and, and you know, key motivator and uh, fodder for, for Twitter, you know, through the entire administration. So I think this is exactly politically the perfect chart to show. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and, and it's now should we let we get your stance, you know, economically, does this work as a metric? Um, and I talked a little bit overall deficits. You can take that, or you can take the bilateral ones that we're showing here. No, I mean I agree with you. It's it's a it's the bilateral trade deficit is essentially a useless metric, um, you know, for for a number of different reasons. One of which is with so much trade now not being in final goods that you know we need to we would need to adjust this if we even really wanted to understand from the U.S.'s perspective. How much of what we're trading with China uh, on the import and export side is really American or Chinese value added, as opposed to say, you know, Japanese content or Korean content embedded in final goods that we're buying from China or American content even? Um, you would you would need to adjust for those kinds of things as well. Uh, and then you know the bilateral imbalances are frequently reflect underlying really solid economic reasons, um, you know, that are just based on things like comparative advantage. There's, there's no good economic theory why trade should necessarily be balanced between any two countries out there in the world. And so while it's, a, it's, it's nice for politics, economically, it's, it's very much a, a meaningless statistic. Yeah, and that's a good point about the supply chains. And I think you even see, you know, it depends how hard you squint, you may see a little of that in this graph as we get to around the, the 2020 era where you can, you can reroute trade. Um, that one of the problems with this, and we're not going to go too far down this, this particular rabbit hole, but one of the problems with this is we tend to count goods as coming from wherever the final thing was shipped. It's not done on the basis of value added. So we saw this very much when China was emerging as a power on the, on the global trading scene, where they might finish a good that was 90% produced in Malaysia or Indonesia, um, but it would count as a 100% Chinese export if it came from China. I think you, you see here that in that era, the, the early part of the, well, actually, the, in the 2020 election kind of time before President Biden came in, you saw the, the bilateral deficit going down with China, but up with the rest of the world. Um, and that is, whether this is why, but that is the kind of effect you would have if you decide to, say, finish a good in Vietnam as opposed to finishing it in China. All right. We could talk a lot about this and we could talk about whether or not. President Trump you know, succeeded by his own standards. But I want to go on to sort of what were the actions 
what happened. Um, and the, the, there's a couple takes I want to say. So first, I look at this graph, and it reminds me of that, you know, Hemingway quote uh, on bankruptcy is, you know, how does one go bankrupt, you know, first gradually and then suddenly. Um, we, we ended up with a lot of tariffs on things as we do tranches. Before we even get to this, though, we sort of, we, it's in the title here, we talk about the Section 301 tariff list. What is Section 301? Where did this come from? Before we get to tranches, what, what motivated all this, Chad? So Section 301 is part of a trade law dating back to 1974. Uh, and in broad terms, you could think about this as where, um, you know, if you're an American exporting industry and you think that trading partners are doing something unfair that is preventing you from being able to access their market. They're not following some sort of rules out there that they've agreed to. You can ask the United States government um, to pursue one of these investigations on their behalf. And we used to see a lot of these things uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, early 1990s, um, before the WTO came along. And then when the WTO came along, the United States really stopped doing using this law to do these kind of investigations and instead sort of brought cases to the WTO formal trade disputes to the WTO on behalf of American exporters when a trading partner, you know, was doing something that we didn't like. Uh, the Trump administration, not a big fan of, of the WTO, and so it sort of reactivated use of this particular law, which had not gone away, it was just not really being used in the U.S. anymore, did an investigation, did a seven or eight month uh, investigation of all the things that China was doing that it, it disliked, and then at the end of that said, China's guilty uh, and we're going to impose tariffs. And just as you said, Phil, beginning in March of 2018, uh, initially they were going to impose $50 billion uh, worth of tariffs or tariffs covering $50 billion worth of imports from China at a rate of 25%. But then over the course of the next 18 months or so, uh, we had this tit for tat action. So we imposed some tariffs, China retaliated. The Trump administration wasn't happy with that, retaliated, ended up imposing tariffs on an additional list of, of, of goods coming in from China uh, until finally, you know, we had four different lists of products that were ultimately hit with with tariffs. Was was there a method, and Chris, feel free to jump in here too. I've always thought of both of you guys, the kind of guys that went with me in the tranches when it came to it. Um, the, sorry about that one. The, uh, but it, was there a method to this in terms of what was list one, list two, list three, list four? Can we characterize this or was this um, just, you know, what were their numbers on the harmonized tariff schedule? Go ahead, Chris, you give it a shot explaining it and then I'll, I'll. Oh, Lordy, okay. Yeah, so the, so the, the original idea as I understood it behind the case was to look at where China had used its intellectual property practices to inveigle itself into global supply chains. So the first two lists, so Chad referred to the $50 billion initial um, amount, they split out these two lists, list one and list two, and, and those are mostly what you call kind of deep supply chain products. So it's semiconductors and it's machine components and you know really the the areas where you know um, uh, trying to limit China's development in those areas might limit their broader ability within supply chain. So list one was very much focused towards uh, high tech. List two more towards kind of mid tech. Um, during the tit for tat process, you suddenly need bigger numbers. And, and so naturally you end up with a situation where list three was more in the way of completed manufactured goods. So, you know, trying to move a little bit kind of down the supply chain to, to more manufactured goods. And that actually ended then started capturing um, more consumer goods. Um, you know, you think about it, if you're, if you're putting a tariff on a engine of some sort, that might be an engine that goes into um, a, um, you know, a, a, an on-site power generator for a construction site, but it could also be the diesel engine that goes into a boat. So, you know, you end up hitting a lot of different industries. And then list 4A, uh, so list, Chad mentioned list four, list four was basically gonna be everything, um, but it got split into two separate lists, 4A and 4B. And 4A includes a lot of um, tumor durables. So you've got like furniture in there, for example. Um, what got skipped was a lot of the kind of um, uh, very visible electronics, uh, so things like mobile phones and laptop computers and so on. So those didn't get captured. Um, 
so yeah so we kind of went from deep supply chain through manufactured products to to certain areas of um of consumer products but i guess you know what we also saw was not you know there were, were different tariff rates applied at, at different times um but actually the next chart maybe if you if you like to go on to that yeah map, is your description. let's do the next chart Chart. And then also, Chad, maybe you can explain to us what this whole phase one, thank you for the description, Chris, what this whole phase one thing was about. So we, we get all of this escalation and then what? So, and I, I think Chris characterized it perfectly. Um, you know, the big takeaway at the end was toward the end of it, they were really trying to avoid consumer goods if they could. And then when they sort of ran out of stuff, they started hitting some consumer goods. And so that last list 4A also included some, I think, clothing and footwear and things like that as well. Um, so, you know, the last round 4A went on in September of 2019. Uh, it, that one was at 15%. Uh, there was another one scheduled to go on. This was gonna be list 4B in December of 2019. Um, but at, right at that stage, you know, the the, the story was that they really wanted a deal. Uh, the Trump administration really wanted a deal. And so we had this phase one agreement um, that was that was ultimately agreed, signed, went into effect in early 2020. And what that did basically on the tariff side was put a freeze on the tariffs. They rolled back slightly. So they cut in half that last tranche on figure on uh, list 4A that went from 15% to 7.5%. Um, and then there was this phase one agreement that, you know, there was a little bit of China agreeing to do some things on their end, some better improvements to intellectual property rights protection, uh, opening up their financial services market to, uh, to, to, to Wall Street, um, getting rid of some technical barriers to trade for agricultural products, things like that. Uh, and then agreeing essentially to, you know, buy an additional $200 billion worth of American exports over the next two years. So that was gonna be essentially the, the phase one agreement that you've seen represented here. But by and large, what it did is it locked in these just much higher tariffs um, that the two sides were imposing on each other. So the US average tariff on imports coming in from China before the trade war was about 3%, uh, and that's now somewhere around 19%, right? It's almost you know a six-fold increase. On the, on the Chinese side, they retaliated. They're, tariff towards stuff coming in from the US started at about 8% in 2018 and is now you know, over 21%. And during the same time period, uh, China kind of somewhat surprisingly actually cut its tariffs toward the rest of the world. Uh, and so its tariffs you know, toward the rest of the world went from something like 8% to now you know, about 6.5% or so um, during that time period. Do we just, well, I'm going to hold this question because I, I'm going to get all excited and we'll do this and we're going to get to this in the next round. Um, let, me, let me just sort of tie up one thing here, which is normally when something calls, someone calls something a phase one agreement, it's kind of suggestive that there will be another phase to follow. What happened there? Well, and, and that's right. And I think even, I forget the exact language, but, you know, when this was announced, President Trump even said, you know, we're going to get started on phase two right away, whereas I think um, his trade negotiators <laughs> really didn't want that to be the case. Uh, you know, they'd been going at it um, with, with China pretty heavily for over a year at that point with, with very little progress. And then early in 2020, we're now in election season in the United States, and then you had the pandemic hit. Uh, and so ultimately, there there was no phase two. There hasn't been a phase two. The Biden administration won the election in November 2020. And, you know, they essentially have not engaged. We won't get into this too much, but, but with China on these things at all. So it was basically phase one, one and done. And, and phase, correct me if I'm wrong here, phase one was sort of much more explicitly market access, some of the traditional things. But they had said that a lot of their target was sort of more serious, re deep seated reform of Chinese practices a whole range, certainly intellectual property, but it was not just limited to intellectual property. And that was supposed to really be the subject of phase two when you would go to sort of the deeper structural change. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. You know, the, the deeper structural change has to do with things like subsidies, uh, China's state-owned enterprises, uh, the myriad form of subsidies that, you know, take place within the Chinese economy that aren't necessarily direct payments from the government to a firm, but can you know, de facto be subsidies through a combination of other types of policies when you when you put them all together. 
you know, that's the big underlying challenge. Uh, it was not addressed really at all in, in phase one. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done in trying to figure out how to get the, the you know, the U.S. economy comfortable with the, the nature of the Chinese economy. We're not there yet. We're not talking about it uh, yet either. Um, and there really, at the moment, also doesn't seem to be much progress in, in even heading in that direction. Yeah. If, if we can, one last topic, and Chris, I'm going to ask you to guide us through this one. Um, one last topic before we go on to our next poll, which is not everyone necessarily had to face these tariffs, even if you were in the sector. Um, there were exclusions. I think that's uh, what the, our next slide covers. Um, what, were, what were exclusions all about and how did that work? Yeah, sure. So the, the exclusions were there to try and protect American business. American manufacturers. The, the argument is, OK, we're going to put a tariff on imports from China, um, but if you can't buy it from anywhere other than China, we don't want you to rest. So you can make an application to the USTR who will consider uh, whether you should be granted some clemency um, and, and not have to uh, and not have to pay the, the tariff. You know, just for the avoidance of doubt, it's the importer that pays the tariff. <laughs> like cash out the door. So there was a, a lot of demand for these things. Um, this chart, um, as Phil and any of our readers know, I like a complicated chart. So I'll talk you through this one very quickly. Um, the left-hand bar is basically uh, the share of imports uh, from each of the lists. So black is list one, dark gray list two, and so on. The uh, second bar is showing you of the, uh, roughly speaking, 2,700 or so, um, exclusions that were granted, what lists they applied to. And so list one and two applications um, uh, were a lot more readily granted, or, or there were a lot more list one and two um, applications per dollar of imports than there were for list three and list 4A. And, and that comes back to that whole made earlier about list one and two being very much down in the supply chain. So you know, if you're an American manufacturer and you go, look, guys, I can't buy this widget from anywhere else in the world. My profit margin is only 10%, and you want me to pay an extra 25% for my product. I'm going to go to the wall. Then you may well have got an exclusion for that. Uh, so about um, sorry, 2,300 exclusions uh, were made. Now those were fixed time deals, um, so you only got your exclusion for a certain amount of time. A whole bunch of them were renewed, but not all of them, and and that's what the uh, the right hand two bars are showing. So. Some of them were renewed, about 24% of them were, were renewed. And then another tranche were extended again. So that's been extended more, more recently. Um, but only around 19%, therefore, of those exclusions actually got extended for, for any period of time. Uh, we're going to talk about what the Biden administration are doing later on. But there was um, a more recent extension um, of around 350 products. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you've got 80 products that got um, exemptions because of uh, their use in the fight against um, COVID-19. So the exclusion process was horribly complicated and remains horribly complicated. You know, I, I'm delighted to say our colleagues in our customs team at Flexport are all over this and know a lot more about it than I do and have got the tools to kind of deal with this as and when we see what the, the Biden administration want to do um, going forward. In terms of what made for successful ex, uh, exclusion as well, um, that was far from simple. So partly showing you know, the, the government, you know, I really, really depend on this product, um, but also the, the style and the way that the exclusion request went in, you know, detail, focus, and, and frankly, but frankly put, some lobbying helped um, as well. And there's plenty of press stories about companies who were successful there. So exclusions, you know, they're still out there. Um, and, you know, there are an issue that the administration's got to address. Phil, can okay, I just jump great. in with so, one, one thing on the exclusion? Yeah, of course you can. Um, so, I mean, just to see in none of your, your any, nobody watching this will be surprised at this, but, you know, the, the, the kind of the worst story with the exclusions came really early on with the pandemic. So in list 4A, um, it turns out there's a bunch of PPE. So, you know, N95 respirators, I think, maybe the protective garments, things like that. Uh, we're sitting under these trade war tariffs. The pandemic hits. 
uh, we're all seeing these stories about how hospital workers are having to wear garbage bags and you know can't get PPE to, to go into the hospital to, to save lives. And it took until the middle of March for the administration to um, grant exclusions, essentially for some of these pieces of PPE. And that's, you know, part of it is they were reticent, they didn't want to change this stuff. Part of it is these, these products are buried into, you know, tariff codes where it's not obvious what they are. They're, they're in, you know, other plastics or, you know, other things of, of, uh, of textiles, things like that. Um, but those, as Chris mentioned, have been the ones that have tended to be extended multiple times throughout the pandemic. And these are important since, you know, we didn't, we didn't have supply chains that made a lot of this stuff in the United States when the pandemic hit. And China really was the world's, you know, residual exporter, supplier of a lot of these, these particular pieces of, of PPE, you know, 60 to 70 percent of, of world exports of this stuff. So arguably the, the tariffs mattered. No, that's a good point. And I mean, I think we can say generally it, it sometimes is uh, is forgotten, but we're importing this stuff because somebody wanted it. Either they, you know, this was the best thing they could find to consume, that you know, this was the most affordable thing they could get for their kids. Or if you're a business, these were you know the best parts that you could get. But you sort of see that very acutely when we have a, a health crisis, and it, it becomes these are the kind of things that can sort of seriously affect the delivery of, of medical care. Um, but a reminder that we sort of do these trade flows for a reason. Okay, let me recap on where we've um, where we're coming from, which is we had the Section 301 case kind of reviving a process that had been popular earlier, had sort of fallen by the wayside and was picked up by the Trump administration. You had rapidly escalating tariffs as you had sort of a tit for tat, and we and we went back and forth on this. You these were tempered somewhat by a sort of clunky, awkward exclusion process that had some carve outs. And the whole thing kind of culminated in a phase one agreement, which for, with a tiny bit of moderation basically locked in a bunch of tariffs. So that's how we got to where we are, I think, as a general thing. We want to talk about next, what did all this mean? What, what were the effects of this? Before we do, we want to ask your impression of what the effects were of all of this. So um, poll time, people, get your, get your fingers ready. Um, what has been the principal impact of the Section 301 tariff? Was it a retooling of supply chains? Was it that it changed China's economic policy behaviors? Was it that it imposed costs on American consumers and businesses? Was it that it achieved American foreign policy goals? Um, or none of the above, our imagination is just not rich enough. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, well, we've, we do have a strong, uh, a strong leader in, in the pack. Um, all right, we're, this is, I don't know whether I can quite say I've seen enough, but uh, it looks like we're, we're leaning very heavily on Im imposed costs on American consumers and businesses um, with uh, retooling of supply chains coming in a, a, a distant second. So, um, and uh, very few thinking that it achieved foreign policy goals or that it actually had an awful lot of effect on China's economic, China's economic policy behaviors. Okay, normally I would say, you know, Chris and Chad, tell me what you would have voted, but I'm going to hold off on that for a second, because what I want us to do is take that we will come back. I, I'm going to try to remember to make them do that. But let's move forward. And thank you for everyone who voted. Very much appreciate it. Let's look in, and see what we thought that um, that the the, the 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 tariffs did to trade. So let's get to our data. And um, Chris, maybe you can talk us through this a bit. Um, what you know, a first thing, I, a natural thing to look at in terms of what they do is what happened to the imports that were covered. Yeah. Yeah, this chart's um, basically showing you um, the, uh, I've, I've bucketed these a little bit, list one and two together, deep supply chain, list three, manufactured goods, list four, some consumer goods in there. Um, the 100 level is basically the average for 2017, so the pre-tariff uh, period, and we've annotated when the, the, the tariffs were Put in place, and um, basically we can see the kind of point to point. Um, we we saw an initial kind of run up just before each set of tariffs comes in, so a little bit of stockpiling into the tariffs. Then you get a big drop off, um, and then obviously we've got this trough um, in early 2020, which was the the pandemic, which as Chad mentioned, kind of coincided with the, the phase one deal coming in. 
Then we have a recovery. Obviously, there's been strength in demand in some of these products, particularly List 4A, which has got those consumer goods in. But point to point, roughly speaking, for all three of these clusters, we're now at around 80 to 90. So effectively, what that's telling us, imports of these products have fallen in dollar terms by about 10% to 20% from the pre-tariff level. Um, and, and that's kind of where we are at the moment. That, that's a, a kind of a, a marked uh, drop down. Ken, is that what you would have expected to see as, as we launched into all this? Yeah, uh, I think I'm, and I it just eyeball econometrics there. It looks like the the black line, which is list 4A, and that one, you know, only has right now a 7.5% a tariff on it, whereas the, the red line and, and green line have the 25% tariffs. So that, the fact that that one, is slightly above that, I think, um, is sort of reflective of economics as well. Bigger, bigger economic impact certainly on the ones that were hit earlier and the and that are facing the the bigger tariffs. I think that basically lines up with what I would have expected as well. well let's, uh, I I do I believe kind of metrics as well. The I, I wonder whether I would have expected things to go down a bit more. This is actually the. the the, the trade sort to be fairly robust, especially when I think one of the considerations on some of the early applications was trying to put tariffs on things where there were ready substitutes, where there was this intent, this intent to drive things away from China. This looks like um, th that it didn't maybe do that as much. Let's go to the next slide. We, I want to sort of get a bunch of things in. And I think that the next one is going to tell us, um, and, and Chris, I'm going to ask you to talk us through this one too. Um, this, we, we talked earlier about some of these product exclusions. This is giving a bit of a verdict on what they did, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So the, the previous chart kind of bundled the products together. It didn't try and pull out like what had got exclusions from those four first four lists. So to, to Chad's point, like you'd expect the lower tariff groups to have performed, quote, better. The, the purple bars in this chart, so this is now year over year change in the US imports of those products. The, 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 the black bars are the list one to four A products that got exclusions. So actually they didn't drop. Um, they, they actually stayed robust. They came down in 2021, but that's more to do with what was in that, that bundle. So for example, the PPE imports started to slow down somewhat. Um, the purple bar though is if you didn't get an exclusion and tariffs were applied, what happened and and so 2019 and 2020 you saw you know really a kind of a, a marked drop um the rebound in 2021 reflects the fact i think you know for me there's a couple of parts to that i think one is that kind of boom in consumer goods remember list three and list 4a is manufactured goods they're the biggest part of this overall cluster um and you know we you know at that point you've got to think we, we saw this we regularly review what companies are saying in their earnings transcripts a lot of them at that point had just stopped talking about tariffs. Like 2019, 2020, everyone's talking about tariffs, everyone's talking about supply chains. 2020, it's all about COVID. 2021, it's all about supply chains being broken and almost nobody was talking about tariffs. So tariffs at that point maybe have become like business as usual. Um, so, you know, that that's why I think you maybe saw the rebound. And in 2021, you know, the, the, the difference between the purple bar, which is list four, one to four A with tariffs, and the green bar, which is everything else that doesn't have tariffs, you know, pretty much grew by the, the same amount. So, you know, maybe tariffs are business as usual and everyone's gotten used to it. Okay, let's, so, so that's where we got with, with exclusions. Let's go to the next slide, because I wanna blow this on the data and then we'll get to a sort of a broad-based discussion of this. Yep. One of our answers that we offered people on the poll was retooling of supply chains. There's a version of that, which is reshoring rather than onshoring. Um, Chris, how are you interpreting this evidence? Yeah, so, so this chart basically looks at all of the products, list four, list one, two, three, four, A, so the whole lot, all of those products, um, imports from China, where 2017 equals 100. So the purple line is the imports from China. So again, as I said earlier, you saw that kind of initial run up as people trying to beat tariffs, then you saw a run down in 2019 and into 2020, and you then saw the recovery and we're now you know, at a level of about 80, so overall down about 20%. The black line shows the imports of those products from everywhere else in the world. And what we basically saw is until the tariffs really bit, which you know, effectively we're looking at late, uh, late 2018 into 2019, 
the two sides, China and the rest of the world, perform together. But since then, we've seen um, the imports from the rest of the world really kind of drive upwards. And in fact, the imports from the rest of the world of kind of list one to four A products are now somewhat over 40% higher than they were back in 2017. Now, again, there's, there's a lot of other elements in there. Th these numbers, for example, are in nominal terms, not real terms. So we've had a bit of a kicker from inflation in there. But you know, it, it, that does suggest to me that you know, buying less from China, buying more from other areas, there was aggregate, aggregate, some sort of reshoring. Not, not necessarily, we can't see onshoring from this, which I think might have been you know, the, the part of the intent of the tariffs. But you know, certainly there's been reshoring in there. So, so, Ted, I would think that this touches on some of the problems of pursuing bilateral policies in, in a multilateral trading world. Um, and that, that may have something to do with what you had talked about, why we had gone more sort of WTO measures as opposed to bilateral. Is that fair or am I reading too much into this? No, I, I think that's right. And, you know, I, there were at moments in time, um, even during the, the Trump administration and even in President Trump's Twitter feed, which I – hate to admit, but was was tracking in, you know, sort of in real time, as, as many of us were, where he even said sometimes that um, reshoring would be OK. I seem to remember he had a tweet that, you know, was saying to companies if they wanted to move out of China and then go to Vietnam, that was OK. Now, it was it was that was not always consistent with the administration's other policies because, you know, they sometimes went after some of these other countries, which made you wonder. Um, did they really mean it or not? Or once they were done with China, you know, ha if there had been a second term, were they going to go after other countries? Well, um, but, but I think that's right. I think the other thing that I would add, and I know this will we'll, we'll get into this more in a moment, but uh, going back to kind of the poll question of, you know, wh what do we expect to see happen? I think we're not surprised to see most of the initial economic effects. Um, being on the consumers and American businesses, you know, sort of bearing the burden. If the changing of supply chains was going to happen, it was probably always going to take time because you did want to see, you know, is was the Trump administration serious about this? Were they going to keep these tariffs on? Right. We didn't know. They were they were, they were doing very, very new things. And so, it, you know, it could have been that these tariffs were going to go on and then maybe they, they could have come off, in which case you didn't want to, have, you know, move your entire supply chain. And then when the Biden administration was elected, you or you know you kind of waited to want wanted to wait to see what was their long term strategy going to be with China as well. Were they going to get rid of all of President Trump's tariffs? Um, and and if so, well maybe you didn't need to, need to move your supply chains after all. So I think some of the supply chain questions are obviously deeper questions, make bigger investment decisions. We're always going to you know take longer to play out, and it, so it may just be that that's now what we're starting to see. No, that's an excellent point. And I certainly I can sort of give you a lot of anecdotal stuff to back that up um, where it's you know, very challenging. And I'm sure many in our audience you know, experienced this firsthand, trying to make plans, trying to make investment decisions when some of, some of the early things were assurances that, you know, trade wars were easy. You win this quickly. Yes, it's a bit extreme to slap 25 percent tariffs on. Endure it for a bit because success is around the corner. Um, I think our next slide will help us decide how much that was true. Um, but but it, no, but it's a very difficult time. And often the choice that someone makes is, you know, they were sourcing from China because clearly they had decided that was the best value for money for where they could source. So do you go to your next best option? Do you take on additional costs? And um, it, it is costly to rework supply chains. And so making that investment and undertaking that additional cost might make sense if you thought 25 percent tariffs were going to last for a very long time might not make sense if you thought that this was just an interlude and that we were going to get back to it so that ex excellent point about that let's look at the next slide because chad this is uh your handiwork i believe um that phase one deal you you, you talked about how'd that work out yeah so after two years um you know the headline was remember uh, China had agreed to purchase an additional $200 billion worth of U.S. exports uh, over the next two years, 2020, 2021. Uh, and even, you know, a couple of days after it was signed, President Trump in Davos said, by the end of this could be $300 billion. Well, at the end of this, it wasn't $300 billion, it wasn't $200 billion, it wasn't $100 billion, it wasn't $1 billion. China didn't even, didn't even get back to 
basically pre-trade war levels um, with with the amount that they bought uh, over the over the course of the over the course of the phase war. So this chart basically looks at a counterfactual of saying, well, let's, let's suppose there had been no trade war at all uh, and no phase one agreement at all, and U.S. exports to China had basically just grown at the same rate as as China's imports from the rest of the world. What would they have looked like? And that's basically the yellow line here. Uh, and so you know, compared to that world, you know, we lost a lot. Uh, over the course of the trade war and even the phase one agreement. Now, there was a conceptual thing behind this, which was the the Trump trade team had been very critical of previous trade agreements and previous trade negotiators who had accepted sort of general statements of, you know, we will get more market access. And so I think what they were selling as a, a key difference was that you would have these numerical targets. Why didn't this work? Yeah, and so, um, I mean, it definitely was a combination of factors. You know, I think we do have to acknowledge the fact that the pandemic hit and, um, you know, demand for certain products um, may have dried up, even though China's imports recovered faster than most in, in 2020. They were certainly lower because of the kind of the initial recessionary phase of the of the pandemic than they would have been otherwise. Um, but, you know, some of the answer to that was, had nothing really to do with the pandemic. It was that China was not going to resume buying certain products, um, you know, despite that. So some examples that, that obviously came up were things like the automobile sector uh, that was caught up in the trade war. The U.S. imposed tariffs on parts coming in from China. China retaliated by imposing 25% tariffs on finished cars. That made certain automakers assembling vehicles in the United States destined for export to the Chinese market actually made them reconfigure their supply chains and say, you know what, if we're producing for China, we're going to do it somewhere else. So Tesla, for example, accelerated, you know, the the the, the production of their uh, plant in, in, thing, in Shanghai, I think it was. BMW, I think, moved uh, some of their exports for China um, somewhere else as well. And, you know, once you've done that, you don't move them back, you know, even with this, this phase one agreement. So, you know, autos never came back. Um, the things that China did buy a lot more of during the phase one agreement, agriculture, um, you know, they got back to 2017 levels and even them exceeded them a little bit, but they really never, you know, sort of met the aspirational targets, uh, new, these numerical targets that the administration had aimed for. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an interesting point, but it was, it certainly sounded appealing, I think, at a, at a the sort of you know, prima facie that, okay, we just, you want more, set a number. Um, so very interesting and useful to have that track and particularly to show what one would have had otherwise. Let's go on to the next slide. And I want to take up one topic, which is sort of an unusual one that has entered into this, um, that uh, let's, let's talk about inflation for a moment. Clearly a big topic of the day. We've got a Fed meeting coming up that's addressing all these things. Um, we normally think about inflation as a monetary policy uh, outcome that you, know, you have you know, too, too much money chasing too few goods and, and you get inflation. Um, of course, that hasn't been everybody's theory of what's going on here. People have talked about you know, one-offs and interruptions and the like. And there have been suggestions emanating from the very distinguished uh, Peterson Institute that uh, you know, one of the biggest measures that the Biden administration could take to, to address inflation would be to cut China tariffs. So I guess, um, let me break this down into two parts. Uh, well, one, you know, where, what is your stance on cutting China tariffs to sort of as a policy measure? But is it reasonable to sort of link that? Or, or what are some of your, and this wasn't you who wrote this paper, but you know, what are some of your colleagues' reasoning for why there might be a linkage to inflation there? Um, so thanks for the, the question and the, and the plug um, to my colleague's work. And so I'd invite anyone who's interested to go and read it because I'll probably mischaracterize certain elements of it. Um, you know, certainly there are links between tariffs and higher prices. You know, one of which you can think of is allowing for more imports uh, allows more competition, you know, um, to take place and puts pressure on companies so that they can't raise prices because now they, they face competition from abroad as well. And, you know, when things are shut out because of really high tariffs, um, that may make it make it more difficult. Um, the, the piece that they, my colleagues wrote and addressed not only the China tariffs, but looked at, you know, sort of a, all of the tariffs that one might feasibly move. 
um, you know, or the administration could plausibly move. I, I think, um, you know, it, it was highly unlikely that the administration was going to do much on the China tariffs in particular, not necessarily for economic reasons, um, but certainly here in Washington, uh, China, U.S.-China relations have really soured, and there would be really large political costs to any administration doing anything that would be viewed politically as being weak on China. And whether or not it's good economic policy, um, removing tariffs is going to be seen as, as somehow being weak on China and giving up leverage. So I was not optimistic that it would happen. Um, why might the effects be relatively small or take a while to wind through on, on the inflation front? Well, for one, you know, the most um, impactful sorts of products, the, the final consumer goods, as, as, as Chris already indicated, are the ones that are only sitting under a 7.5% tariff at the moment. And, you know, so cutting from 7.5% to zero as opposed from 25% to zero, um, you know, is, is sort of a smaller impact. The ones that are on 25% are intermediate inputs, parts, components, equipment, things that go that are going to take time to work their way through, you know, the supply chain probably to end up uh, actually bringing down inflation in in terms of final consumer goods. So the options there for the administration, I think, are not you know great in terms of thinking that you can do a lot um, when it comes to actually uh, achieving much on inflation through the tariff channel. And I think finally, just to conclude, the biggest impact on inflation is monetary policy and the Fed, uh, just in general tariffs. We don't think of, there's lots of good reasons to dislike tariffs and to want to get rid of them. They impose harmful costs on the society, on society, on businesses. They create sorts of supply chain disruptions, but they're not generally the first order tool that you would want to be out there using um, to try to tackle this, the really big problem today, which is inflation. Okay. Cool. Thank you on that. Um, all right. Let's, I want to wrap this up so we can talk about what we promised to actually what you just sort of linked us to, which is what else the Biden administration might do, whether it's setting up inflation aside, what they might do for trade policy purposes. Before we do, I want to go around with all of us and you know, subject us to the same question we subjected uh, the, our, our audience. Chad, you can start, then Chris, I'll come to you next. If you were going to just quickly say what you see as the principal impact of the Section 301 tariffs, I won't even necessarily limit you, you're a guest, um, to the, the multiple choice, but what would your pithy take be on the principal impact of those tariffs? Well, I, I, I do think that, you know, short run, it was costs to uh, American businesses and primarily, you know, higher input costs, uh, ultimately feeding through toward, you know, end consumers. But if that's taken place, it really did take time. And the initial economic evidence was it was primarily the, the importers and the businesses that were bearing the burden. Um, over time, you know, now that we're seeing that the, the Biden administration really isn't sending any signals that there's going to be a reversal of, of, of the tariff policy and in other respects may get worse, we may see eventually um, some of these supply chains moving. Again, it's not companies looking to get out of China, 1.4 billion people there, there's a lot of consumers, you wanna be there to be able to service the Chinese market, but that may not be a viable, a viable place anymore to be doing business if ultimately part of that business, what you want to have it be doing is to be able to service the, the U.S. market as well. Okay, thank you. Chris, where are you on this? How, yeah. how would you answer our poll question, even if there was a write-in option? Yeah, so I, I, would, I would definitely go with imposed costs. I mean, that, that previous chart showed $4 billion a month of, of tariff payments. You know, it's a fiscal drag in, in, in that regard, putting aside all of the, the economic effects. Um, we, we have seen companies retooling their supply chains, but they were doing that anyway. Like corporations have an imperative to maximize shareholder value, and they do that by boosting revenues, which they can do by being in China and making stuff in China for China but also minimizing their costs. So they were doing this anyway, you know, Chinese labor costs have been going up. That's why they were moving to Vietnam anyway. So this might have been a, a push, but it certainly wasn't the tariffs necessarily that there were that were the prime mover of, of what companies were doing uh, in terms of retooling their supply chain. So, so yeah, I would say it was, um, you know, it's those costs on businesses and on main impact. And, and I would agree with everything that, that you two have said. And just to be a little bit different, let me toss in then a twist and a write-in for mine, which is I don't think it helped the state of the global trading system, which does matter because frequently 
you know, this is even when U.S. companies are trying to export, you know, when you have this trading system, do others behave? And we have been working towards a rule-based system. And Chad has written a lot on this, so I'm kind of stealing his his lines here. But a, a rule-based system and this somewhat sort of capricious tit-for-tat was exactly the sort of, un, you know, uncontrolled escalation that we weren't supposed to have. And if the principal players in the trading system can do it, um, just as Chad said, you know, we might see supply chain changes down the line. We might see behavioral changes down the line when other countries feel less constrained, saying, hey, look, if they can, you know, can do this, so can we. All right. I want to move us to the stuff that Chad was hinting at um, in terms of, well, we, we plug this with, you know, the Biden administration has a decision before it. President Biden on the campaign trail um, did speak out about how these tariffs imposed costs. The administration did a review, which I think mostly culminated in a decision to review some more, and now they're also reviewing. But Chad, you are a highly connected Washington, D.C. trade insider. What have they whispered in your ear that they're going to do next? So um, I think they've whispered in my ear that whatever they're going to do is probably when I'm on vacation. Um, so, <laughs> uh, But I'm planning lots of vacations over the, over the next six months, so that doesn't really tell us much in terms of timing. I mean, I think... Look, there would have been for for everything I said earlier about um, you know looking weak on China by cutting tariffs. At the same time, if you were actually interested in doing this for economic policy reasons, you couldn't ask for a better opportunity than the inflation environment to give you you know a political opportunity to to do something. And they just have not grasped it, grasped grasped it, which leads me to believe they're not really all that interested. So my guess at the moment is if they do do something on the tariffs, it will likely be relatively small. Um, and it's also not clear what form it might might, might take, you know, if it's there, because to businesses, there's going to be a big difference between, you know, we're going to cut tariffs forever. We promise not to reimpose them, you know, on these products forever. And so go ahead, businesses, and, and restart, you know, uh, buyer-supplier relationships that may have been severed at some point in time you know, make your firm specific investments and, and rejuvenate that because we're now back together for the long term versus, well, we're going to waive these tariffs, you know, for six months and something like that. But in, li in all likelihood, they're, they're likely to, you know, go back on again six months from now. And so I think there's still just a, a lot of uncertainty as to how this is going to play out, even if it is some tariff reduction at all, um, you know, what products would be covered and then ultimately how long this thing would ultimately last. So let me let me push you a little bit on what the forces are that are shaping this. We've we've just talked a bunch about why they might have imposed costs. You know, you've got an inflationary environment. Why you might be inclined to just what do you think is causing reluctance within the administration? And is this sort of an active debate? Is there other different factions? Yeah, I, I, to be fair, I think it's you know it's not all that different from the Trump administration in that you have different voices within within the administration. You will have some that come at it very much from the national security point of view that are very worried about you know China for non-economic reasons. Um, you have a number even from the economic point of view that are very worried about other aspects of the relationship, whether it be you know um, labor concerns especially, you know, forced labor and, and human rights types of concerns that suggest that we should actually be trading less with, uh, with, with China for those reasons as well. Um, and then you'll have some of the, the economic forces. And then you'll have the kind of standard trade folks, which will say, look, we've got all these tariffs on China. Now is our time to actually have some leverage with them. Yeah, we have said the, the Biden administration, we're going to work with allies. But now, you know, Europe seems to be more interested in engaging. Maybe Japan is as well. We could collectively get with China and start to tackle the areas of joint concern, like those subsidies and state-owned enterprises and, and things like that. So we shouldn't give up the tariffs because those are our main form of leverage that we have until we get some action and the ability for us to, to actually you know, negotiate on those things too. So I think it is a combination of all these competing voices and it's difficult to then form one common approach until they you know, sort of get internally resolved. So the, the U.S. trade rep, Catherine Ambassador Tai, Catherine Tai, has been quite emphatic on that last point that you made, that, you know, th this is negotiating leverage. Don't take this away. So the, uh, before we go to our poll, let me just ask you, Chad, in terms of uh, for a forecast, to the extent we see these things going away, 
Do you anticipate that it will be unilateral action on the U.S. part? After all, they were kind of imposed unilaterally. Will it be part of a bilateral deal between the U.S. and China? Or you mentioned that maybe there's interest from other countries. Will it be part of a multilateral endeavor? What is the most promising avenue to which we would see these addressed, through which we'd see these addressed? Well, promising would be multilateral, but I'm, I don't have any hints that, that that's actually taking place um, yet. I, I think it's, it's possible the other things that have been leaked, reported, are that the administration might uh, initiate their own Section 301 investigation. And our, this might be you know, the sort of phase two that might be the way to investigate the concerns over China's subsidy and in industrial policy and state-owned enterprises and those other areas of, of concern that weren't really tackled either in the initial Section 301 investigation the Trump administration did or the phase one agreement um, that, that was the result of that. But that being said, you know, you really can only tackle that sort of issue constructively uh, if you do it with other trading partners, the Europeans, the Japanese, and other, other major players, and they just haven't gotten to the phase yet, to my knowledge, of, um, of being able to work with them on that kind of stuff yet. They've been much more proactive and engaging with them on lots of issues. We've seen, obviously, it's, it's come up with the sanctions with respect to, to Russia, with the invasion of Ukraine. There's a lot of active engagement um, uh, you know, on trade with those countries, but I'm not sure yet that they're actively you know, working on the details of what do we need to do collectively, jointly to deal with concerns over, say, Chinese subsidies. So you're, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're what should happen is that we should have a multilateral discussion to address this. You're what will happen is we're just not going to see an awful lot of movement that may be sort of limited tariff withdrawal support. Chris, is that what you would sign on to? I think so. I, I would actually also say that Section 301 and tariffs are only a small slice of US-China relations more broadly. So, you know, the, the, the conversation between President Biden and President Xi, which I think is due to happen in the next few days, maybe possibly, depending on calendars and so on, is going to touch on, you know, Chad mentioned the, the uh, conflict in Ukraine. It's going to touch on security issues um, in the South China Sea. Um, it's going to touch on labor practices and all of those kind of things. So, you know, I guess it, the tariffs provide leverage, but there's a lot of stuff that needs to be moved around. Yeah, fair point. All right. Before we close, we're running short on time. I want to go back to the audience for, for another poll to sort of ask whether you leave this optimistic, pessimistic, um, or uh, I, don't, I doubt indifferent, but when do you think that the majority of the Section 301 duties will be removed? And the, this is really sort of in order of timing, um, before the end of 2022, during the first quarter of next year of 2023, sometime between the second quarter and the end of 2024, during the next presidential administration, or Never. They are here to stay. Um, and it looks to me like we've depressed you all. Well, at least you've got something you can plan on. Um, so let's see. We've got never they're here to stay, yeah, just under two thirds, um, and then a tight race. Almost no one is thinking, um, or a very small number are seeing it before or during Q1, um, which I think is probably a reflection of, of the of, of some of the sort of tensions here. I think there is one of the reasons we divided this up, by the way, between Q1 is there does seem to be a sense, and I think Chad made some mention of this, to which you, you have sort of a lot of political pressures here, and no one wants to be seen as soft on China in American politics at the moment. And so the closer one is to election, the, the more difficult it is to sort of make a, a big move on, on, on this. So I think that's where we're seeing uh, well, like about roughly 90% weight, which is that it's coming later. But that would be the thing about the Q223 and the end of 2024, is this does put you in the sort of traditional times we're getting either close to or in the midst of a presidential election. All right. Um, we thank you all for joining us. Um, unfortunately, we are now out of time, not out of interesting things to talk about. But I want to thank Chris for his insights and Chad in particular. Let me underscore. Uh, what a pleasure it's been to have you with us. Yes, that's a plug. Go listen to the Trade Underscore Talks podcast. It's great. Um, do so regularly. 
Um, thank all of you out there for attending today's session. We will email out the slides and we'll link to this recording tomorrow morning. Um, we're also dropping a short feedback survey into the chat. Please take a moment to share your thoughts and your feedback with the team so we can continue to curate great content for you. So thank you again and have a great day.